false teachers, Paul says, subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake, money. Why, do you know, my dear friend, if it were not true that in Christianity we were taught to give as God has given to us, if we were not taught to give freely and liberally, why, the false teachers and their cults could not survive. They survive because of the Christian doctrine of giving and because they prey on Christian congregations. If it were not for Christianity true and pure, there would not be any Mormonism. There would not be any Jehovah's Witnesses. There would not be any Seventh-day Adventists. There would not be any Christian Scientists. There would not be any unity. And we could just go right down the line of others. For you see, it is of tremendous motivation to an evil man to proclaim a Christianity which he does not know in his heart for the sake of gain. And it was customary in Paul's day for the elders to be given money. Paul said, let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those that labor in the word and teaching. And so why not labor in word and teaching and receive from these gullible, simple, naive Christians who are so filled with love their gifts and their money? Paul says an elder should be a man in the sixth verse or seventh verse who is not given to filthy lucre. But the false teachers are men who for filthy lucre's sake teach. Now Paul concludes by quoting one of the Cretans' own poets. He says, One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, The Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and slow bellies. And we're inclined to say in the 20th century, Yes, that's the Cretans, but we're different. No. But Paul says they are liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. And when he says that, he is saying what may be said of human nature. Now he turns to Titus and he says in verse 13, This witness is true, true, and Titus is to do what elders must do. What are the elders to do in the light of the false teachers? Why, he says, rebuke them sharply. Reprimand them without compunction. Do not have any sense of compunction whatsoever about speaking sharply to the false teachers. So rebuke them sharply. And will you look at verse 11? I omitted this because I wanted to bring it in here. Whose mouths must be stopped? Now, I want you to look at that carefully because there are lots of people who think that if a person comes up and speaks to a false teacher sharply, that's being unloving. Paul says, whose mouths must be stopped. And the Greek word is a word from which we obtain the word muzzle for it means really to put something over their mouth like you would a dog. For they are dogs. That's what Paul calls false teachers elsewhere. They are dogs. And so what they need is muzzling. We would say in the 20th century, false teachers are to be gagged. They are not to be allowed to teach their teaching. And by the way, If the Christian church, if my own denomination had 50 years ago done what the scriptures say about the false teaching that Paul does, when it arose, we should have a purer denomination today. It is because, you see, we fail to exercise discipline that error gains a foothold and soon as it permeates like leaven the congregations of God The truth is in the minority. And so it is the responsibility of an error to gag the the, an elder to gag the errorist whose mouth must be stopped. And I would gather that that means that there is an occasion in which you should speak sharply too. If I were to see your house on fire and I were to come over to you walking very slowly and quietly and Uh, gently and say, pardon me, sir, I hope you won't think I'm intruding. I know this is a little little bit rude, and Amy Vanderbilt might not approve, but your house is on fire. You would wonder what in the world is the matter with me. Uh, We would, of course, rush up to you and almost bowl you over and say, go home quickly, your house is on fire. And so when we come to the errorists in the Christian church, we should not speak to them in love 
in the false sense of love, but in the true sense of love, we should speak to them sharply. We should attempt to gag them, muzzle them, in order, Paul says, that they might become sound in the faith. For sometimes it is necessary to speak sharply before one wakes up. That's the way our Lord spoke. He said, beware of the false prophets. He said, you know these false prophets, they come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil, evil fruit. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Have we not spoken in tongues in thy name? Have not gifts of healing taken place in our congregations in the 20th century in thy name? He says, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then Jesus said, I will profess unto you, depart from me ye that work iniquity. Our Lord doesn't hesitate to speak plainly and clearly. And do you remember Peter? It's the first pope, you know. So we're told. So we're told. He's quite a bit different from the political popes of the 20th century. They don't speak anything sharply because they're trying to please everybody. But when Simon Magus came to him and saw that through the apostles' laying on of hands the Holy Spirit was given, he walked into Peter's hotel room and he said, uh, Give me also this power that on whomsoever I lay my hands he may receive the Holy Spirit. And Peter said, Now, my dear Simon Magus, you have not received sound instruction in the word. And I want you to come on home with me and stick around a while, and after I've won a hearing with you due to my kindness and uh, care of you, my wife will feed you and help you out, and after a little while we'll discuss these things. No, he didn't say anything like that. He turned to him and he said, Thy money perish with thee. Now, I've said, uh, I've often said this, and I really believe it, the only way to translate that in the 20th century is to say to hell with you and your money. Because that's what Peter is saying. Thy money perish with thee. Listen, thy money perish with thee. And he goes on to say, your heart's not right with God. Repent therefore of this wickedness and pray God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. For I perceive thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. And Simon said, pray for me. Now the early church said that he became a Christian. We have no evidence of that, but... Peter was careful to speak the truth sharply to him, that he may be sound in the faith. And did you notice that expression in verse 13? Rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. And the word for sound is a word that is frequent in the pastorals, and it really means, or it comes from a Greek term that means to be healthy. Sound doctrine in the pastorals is healthy doctrine. So in apostolic language, the man who is healthy is the man who knows his theology. Sadly, in the 20th century, it's often thought the man who's unhealthy is the man who knows theology. The man who's healthy is the fellow who's all caught up in emotion and in all of the things that happen in some of our Christian congregations. But in the Bible, it's the man who has the sound doctrine that is healthy and the man who is unsound in his doctrine in his theology is sick that's apostolic understanding the true theology of the word of God is healthy and you cannot be healthy in the Christian faith until you know the theology of the word of God suppose I would ask you a few questions about theology What's the doctrine of reconciliation? What's the doctrine of propitiation? What's the doctrine of the filling of the Spirit? What's the doctrine of the two natures of Jesus Christ? That could be a little more complicated, you know. What's supralapsarianism? <laughs> and how would you distinguish that carefully and 
correctly from infralapsarianism. You see, uh, some of you are beginning to feel a little ill. <laughs> well, you're beginning to discover really what you are if you have not sound doctrine. For it is sound doctrine that makes you healthy spiritually. And it's the unsound ignorance that we have as Christians that makes us sick spiritually. So, rebuke them that they may be sound in the faith. Now Paul denounces them in the last two verses, and I only want to say one or two things about this. He is speaking, of course, primarily of the ceremonialism and asceticism that the Cretan false teachers sought to impose on the Cretan churches. And so he says, unto the pure, that is the pure in heart, all things are pure ceremonially. I can do anything if I am pure in heart, that is, anything that the word of God has not spoken against. All things are lawful for me, Paul said elsewhere, but all things are not necessarily expedient. All things are not necessarily, all things do not necessarily build up the saints, but all things are lawful. To the pure, all things are pure. By the way, this does not mean if a man is pure in heart, he will not be affected by anything else. That's not something that Paul says. But he says, to the pure in heart, all things are permitted. In other words, you may taste this, you may handle this, you may touch that, if the word of God has not spoken specifically against it. But unto them that are defiled and unbelieving in heart is nothing really pure. Even the things that you can do, according to the Gnostic teachings, you corrupt because your own mind is corrupt. And you see, what Paul is saying is essentially that the person who in his inner mind and heart is out of touch with God is impure in heart, unclean, and everything he touches becomes unclean. Even the ancients who weren't Christians understood that. Horace said, unless the vessel is poor, pure, everything you pour into it grows bitter. Seneca said, just as a diseased stomach alters all the food which it receives, so the darkened mind turns everything you commit to it to its own burden and ruin. You see, the sad truth is, my dear friends, because of our human nature, holiness is incommunicable. You cannot communicate holiness. But unholiness is communicable. And so the unholiness of the man out of fellowship with God touches everything that he does. That's why we believe that one of the sound doctrines is total depravity. That doesn't mean everybody is totally bad. It means that everybody has been touched by sin in all of the spheres of his being.